Um, I'm actually going to stand right here so that I can run the laptop. Is that a? I'll, I'll do it. Thank you. Um, so can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so digital storytelling. Um, how many of you think that I'm going to tell you you all need to be on Twitter today? Nobody. Good. Uh, did you think I was going to tell you about Facebook? Um, so kind of the reason that, that I, I came up with this um, was because I think that in, in this environment that we're in now with all of this information coming at us all the time, I think we kind of get, we sort of confuse the medium with the message. When somebody says digital storytelling, very often what they come back to me with was, oh, we need to put that on Facebook. And that isn't really what we're talking about, and I don't think it's what we want to do. Um, and so I kind of wanted to step back a little bit from the various uh, distribution outlets that we use and talk more about what it is that we're trying to accomplish and show some examples of how people have approached those, those questions. Um, so I'll start out with what is the story? Um, I assume that you all might have seen this movie. This is in the, back in the dawn of time, 1995, almost 20 years ago this movie came out. <laughs> what, what do you remember about it? What do you remember about Toy Story? Anybody? Emotional. Do you remember that it's the very first computer animated feature film? Is that the first thing you think of? And that's, what, that's what's happening. This is a revolutionary technological achievement. But what people remember are Woody and Buzz becoming friends. That's what it's about. They told a great story. If this had been neato CGI, nobody would care. Um, so, and, and so that's kind of like where, how I try to approach things um, in, a, in a Toy Story way. Um, cause it, you, when we talk about storytelling, it's not audio, it's not video, it's not text, it's what is it that I'm getting out of it? It's, it's emotional, it's what I'm, what I'm taking away, what I'm learning, how my, my mind is being expanded. And that's kind of what, what we're trying to do in a new format. Um, and so, and then back, we, we just moved to, to primitive times, way back in 2003. This is, um, I used to be the digital editor at the Savannah Morning News many, many years ago. And this is a project that we did when we launched the, um, the Iraq War. We sent a reporter and a photographer to Iraq to ride with the 3rd Infantry Division who were based near Savannah. Um, everything in one place. What this is about is we just took everything. We have a daily newspaper. There's a daily story every day. And people can read that and, and throw it away. But what we did was took all of these stories that they were giving us and put them all in one place. Um, we've got day one through day 27. They were there for a month until the, we rolled into Baghdad. Um, and this is uh, something I did with the reporter, photographer, myself, and a, and a web producer. Um, and in addition to that, the, the sort of text and photo format we have in our daily newspapers we gave Noelle a satellite phone. So she was dialing us up, and we have audio portions of, of her reporting from Iraq in here. Um, John gave us uh, a lot of images, and so we were um, doing slideshows every day and, and audio slideshows. And this is in 2003. This is 10 years ago, not quite. Um, and so I think that this, this is a really good example of kind of like just putting it all together. Um, and I want to kind of show you, if I can. Yeah, I actually, I thought that this had been lost to the mists of time. Oh, there's Lunch and Learn now, sorry. Um, <laughs> I actually thought this had been lost in the mists of time, but uh, I stumbled upon it. It's still live, which is there. I can go back nine years later and see this. Everything as it happened right then. Um, and one of the other things that we did that you cannot do in a daily newspaper, and it, okay, this is 10-year-old flash animation, so bear with me. Um, we tell the story in a different way. We've got, um, basically, we're detailing the entire 
um, advance in, into Baghdad in, a, in an animated format, um, which I think I was really proud of, of the work we were able to do. Um, we won an AP award for this. AP or NAA won, but um, it felt good to win something. Um, we've got, uh, here we go, audio reports. We teamed up with WTOC, which is a TV station down there. So this is Noel sitting in a Humvee talking on the satellite phone that we could then reference from our daily newspaper and say, listen to Noel talk. She's interviewing soldiers, um, and it was really amazing stuff. And meanwhile, back here at home, we're able, we were talking to the, the wives and families of these soldiers who had gone off to a new war. Um, and so we were able to give, put everything in one place, tell this whole story that was just kind of impossible to do in a daily newspaper. And it's all right here. And uh, um, so I'm proud of this work. And that's why I wanted to show it to you. Um, then we have depth. So more war. Um, this is a, a Washington Post story about traumatic brain injury. Wow, that sounds like science. It's medicine. I don't know anything about that. How do you tell that story in a way that people can relate to? What, is, what does it mean? I can write your straight you know, health story and talk about concussions and um, people coming home to not being able to deal with the world. But what they have done is, is added this kind of depth to that story, a human emotional element that, again, you can't really get in a, in a daily newspaper sometimes. Um, and so I'm going to show you that. So, th and this is how it's presented on, on their website, even right now. You have, so this is the story, this is the story that people read in the newspaper. Traumatic brain injury, rising problem, da 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 da. Okay, I get it. So what does that mean to me? Um, well, that's what this is. Then I can hear these guys Oh, and of course they're going to have an ad, Jared. <laughs> um, uh, but look at, look at this here. I'll let the ad play. Um, how can you help or get help? These are the research. This is, I can do something about this now. It's not this foreign thing. I can, I can actually be involved. How can you help or get help? Stories and reactions. People coming back and forth about this. Um, this guy. Um, these, I mean, these video portraits are amazing to, to watch these guys talk about what happened to them and how it's been affected. And I was a, I'm an army soldier. Look at this. And there, there is some language involved. So if, when you go back and maybe you listen to this, be aware. Um, but again, this isn't like, oh, neat, web video. This is telling me a story about who these people are. And they use the video to serve that purpose. Um, and these, the, uh, this is really outstanding. Um, you can, so up here we have the, you know, the navigation elements of, around who these individual soldiers are, uh, brain animation, how all of this works. And so it's really deep stuff. It's not somebody was in a roadside bomb attack. It was, this is what happened to them afterward. And now they're home and they're, the war is over for them and their lives are, completely altered. And it's, I mean, it's an emotional, deep story that the Washington Post does a really good job of telling. Um, oops. And then it's, it's, it's topical. This is um, KQED's MindShift blog. And so what this is, is, um, for example, we write a lot of stories about education. They do too. At one point, it's, it's part of NPR's Argo blog project. And so you, in, in blogging, you typically try to stick to one thing. You kind of have to show some consistency in, in what you're covering, or else people kind of lose, lose the thread. And so what they did was they took their educational technology stories, not everything about education, but about educational technology, and they put it all in a blog. This is a major educational technology resource now, not just for them, but for everybody nationally. Um, they won some award for it, and I forget which one it is. But um, 
So if you're interested at all in the ways that students are using technology to learn, this is a reference that you can use. So it's, it's expanded beyond their, their daily news coverage. It's expanded beyond just a, you know, an education story. And that's kind of how, how they've approached this. Um, you've got, so it's a little awkward shifting from PowerPoint to the browser, but it's no good without a browser. Um, so nine dangerous things, using the internet to consider cheating. But look too, in many ways, they're just text and picture. The strength of this site really is in its focus. It's, it's really topical focus. And we really have a strength in talking about Atlanta because we know everything about this uh, town. Um, but two, one thing that we should always think about too within stories is that Nobody says hyperlink anymore, but hyperlinks. Um, within this story, um, you, you, we read now about the filter. We're the filter. We're the media filter. So I have all of this that's filtered and actually condensed in a really great way for me to be able to understand it. But then when they reference something like Education Week, high tech cheating, that links out to something else. And so I can get a primary source, hopefully, so that I can, I've removed. In presenting this story, they've enabled us to remove the filter. And I think that's something that digital has a unique way of doing. Um, and then we'll go to point of view. Thank you, Dave. For, uh, Dave showed me this. Um, Christian showed me this. So. Thank you, Christian, ultimately. <laughs> um, this point of view. <laughs> Stories always have a point of view. Um, and actually, you know what, I'm just, I'm kind of going to talk and talk, but if you all have a question, just shout it out. I know I'm halfway through now, but um, 8 million people in the New York area. <coughs> one in 8 million. They can go to one person and have them tell their story. Again, primary sources. Obviously, there's an editor involved in these. Um, but by removing um, what's happening here, and there's audio playing him, him talking. There's no, there's no reporter involved. It's this guy uh, telling his story. That's it. And so they're, they're giving these kind of point of view stories about who these people are and what it is that they do, and they're right there in their lives. This took, I mean, a photographer, a photographer, somebody recording sound, and then somebody to produce it online. Um, and now we know who Joseph Cotton is. These, I mean, these are really amazing. Um, and it, it, frankly, are very simple to do. Um, you have a, a still photographer. And at New York Times is a really advanced kind of multimedia department. Most likely, this photographer actually did the sound recording as well. Because um, they, they've really made a big push to get their sort of multimedia um, team going. But I, I highly recommend this. Um, these are really good. <laughs> right, and that's, yeah, that's what we had been talking about. Um, so, yeah, the, these are uh, the way that um, there's something like a billion people on the internet now. So a billion people have access to Joseph Cotton, grandfather. And that, that to me is completely amazing. Um, and that, that's kind of what, at some point in my career, I decided I wasn't interested in what, how computers work, but in how we can work with computers. And this is the kind of stuff that, that I'm really interested in, that, that they enable us to be right next to somebody, to, to hear directly in their own voice from other people, other humans. And I think that's what brings us together and, and connects us to each other. Um, multiple perspectives. So in addition to the, the single point of view, this is really cool. Um, and we don't necessarily have this issue all the time, but last January would have been nice. Um, so uh, WNYC did this thing where 
people out, they didn't generate this. They, put, they enabled the map, but what they asked people to do was tell us if your street has been plowed. And so they had people out texting to text plow to 30644 to say what these locations were that had been plowed or not. And so this is an outstanding service for everybody in uh, Manhattan. Um, and so, and people get to, uh, yeah, and right here, you can't see this, it says snow stories, what's happening in your neighborhood. So people were actually telling them how this snow event was going on for them. And that, so at this level, they've just enabled the storytelling. They just kind of cut people loose. Hey, here's a tool, tell us what's happening. Um, and this also plays into like the mapping. Um, so we can kind of get a different, um, different perspective on this. And I can see, how, how does this relate to me? Oh, well, there's my block. I can find where I live. Looks like you know, my, my route to work is clear of snow. Um, and the, you know, the resources they expended were essentially internal. They didn't have to send out, what, 40 reporters to find all of this, these snow plow uh, areas. And they didn't have to depend on anyone but their audience. To, to get to make this happen. But didn't that, become, that came because of the Brooklyn Borough President bitching on the air. Did it? Oh, yeah. He got on the air and he was complaining that, you know, we have this big city and nobody's gone out to plow this block and this block and this block. And oh. Happened between Brooklyn and Queens mm -hmm. is what it was. Manhattan, they, they couldn't move the snow and dump it into the Hudson River because that would screw up the levels and the salt and everything like that. Oh, yeah? So that New York was screwed pretty much. So they solved a problem. They kind of solved the problem, but it was the Brooklyn Borough President getting on the air and being very unprofessional about what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> we, Rick and I were on the highway here yet, and they, we were on uh, listening to uh, CBS 88, and he was on the air live. I mean, they had to bleep him a couple of times. <laughs> and it was just, you know, what the, uh, why can't we move the snow? Why can't we move this out? We, can, we have landfills. We could put it here. We could put it there. But what it had to be was, they had to get cranes or actually get plows, dump it into a dump truck, and move it into New Jersey or something like that. Huh. I'm not from New Jersey, guys. My husband's from New Jersey, But it all, this whole thing came because of the Brooklyn Borough President railing on On that. WNYC? It wasn't on NYC. He huh. went, the, whatever stations covered him live, uh -huh. whenever they did the press conference, I doubt it was WNYC. Huh. Because they do classical music, more or less. But... It was on a lot of the AM radio stations in New York. And because of that, this AM happened. 20. That is, is fascinating. So, so that, um, I think that, that brings up an interesting point is that when um, that is not necessarily connected to this, because I, I didn't find that specific story okay. attached to this. So um, context, it, you know, context is, is also important to put in there. And that's kind of a, an open question at, the, at this point. Um, but regardless, it's not necessary really to know that part of this story to have this be useful. Yeah. Oh, I know that, but that's yeah. Story Thank you. That's great. Um, but having the ability to capitalize on your audience and say, "Please help us out and help out everybody else who lives around you," I think that's a really powerful method. Um, and yes, please. Probably. That's a Google Map implementation. Okay. Um, so I, I don't see why not. I haven't actually tried, but that's a good question. Um, and that, yeah, that's something I should mention too. All of this stuff is on desktop websites. And we're moving beyond that now. If I can't see this on my phone, then I've kind of, it's kind of lost a lot of its utility. Um, I can't see how that wouldn't be available on your phone because they want you to text from the street. Yeah, I'm walking down my street now. Please text us. And so I would assume they have to work together. If, if they don't, then that's an oversight. Um, forming communities. Um, so the, the Wall Street Journal has this kind of amazing um, online community uh, that kind of shows us um, What's, what's neat about the way that they do this is if I can, uh, they have, their, their sort of, um, their news stories 
their, their comment system links to this community forum. Do you all remember forums and message boards, popular eight to 10 years ago? That's, that's really what they're doing here. They have their, um, in addition to their news stories linking over to boards related to that story, they also allow their community to come up with topics of their own. And I would assume that their newsroom is pulling topics out of those stories that people are, that are hot, that people are talking about. And also within their system, they have hot, hot topics. Um, do we need religion to have ethics in the religion and ethics group? It's not really attached to anything. It's just people are interested in this question and they're discussing it. How does this happen? It's not, um, sometimes in our internet comments, they're really um, focused on that, that one story. But religious ethics is something that's bigger than any daily story. And so that's, how, that's what this is kind of addressing, how, how people can, long-term issues that people can kind of approach in a different way among their peers, hopefully, and hopefully be respectful, which is a problem on the internet. Um, spotlight on discussions related to economy, I guess, in the Warren Buffett case. Uh, questions for their community. Um, should divorce be banned? So what they've done is taken, you know, the president's announcement yesterday and then this side of, kind of side conversation about, well, um, you know, if gay marriage damages the family, doesn't divorce also damage the family? And so they, they've pulled this out of that. While it's not directly related to this issue, it is what people are relating to that issue. It's what people are, are putting together in their minds. And so we get to talk about that. Um, they pull out individual members to say, hey, you know, Rick's on the community now. Um, now this is different though than Facebook, because Facebook is essentially what my you know, friends. This is like random people who want to talk about a particular topic, um, who want to be, to be involved here. Um, you can see groups, connections, questions. So, you know, message boards were really kind of a primitive form of social media. Um, so they've got somebody back on their back end uh, pulling out the stuff, featuring quotes, thinking of questions. And this is all um, tangential related to what they're covering in their daily news, news cycle. Um, groups around different high, high topics. So it's not, um, I don't know, health and wellness. It's not a, a specific item. It's, it's a broad topic. Health and wellness. What does that even mean? Let's talk about different things related to health and wellness. And people kind of self-select the topics they're interested in. Um, and I think they've done this, this really well. And this one does not cost money. Like uh, I believe the WSJ has a paywall now. Um, and then talking about it. So this is, um, this is the social media slide. Flickr and Twitter and YouTube and uh, Tumblr blogs such as Public Square Atlanta uh, and Facebook. This is where related to communities, this though is sort of the water cooler. This is our water cooler now. I can say I went and saw the Avengers. It was awesome. Here's a cool YouTube video that I found. Um, or, you know, this made me mad today. And I can talk about it among people with like interests. So where you know, your kind of open community is more about um, sounding off among a group, this is more my personal uh, network, I guess, my, my friends, the, the people that, that I'm interested in. Because if I'm creating something online, I attract a following. Um, while it might not be, you know, Justin Bieber's following level, there are people who are interested in what I, Jason Parker, have to say. Um, so, so in this, it's kind of more personality driven than content driven. And that's kind of what social media really is. Um, and then, you know, obviously the, the, and then the personality of an institution such as WAB News. 
where we're putting things out and people expect you to have a personality in, in social media. They expect you to talk about a particular thing. Um, when, I, when I give blogging presentations, I talk about commitment and consistency and credibility. And those are three key elements to kind of really developing your, your online uh, presence. And that, that's, so in the case of, for, for example, Flickr is a big photo, um, photo photography community. Flickr also has message board elements and groups. So the one that I copied here is the Atlanta group. And that group has pictures all about Atlanta and people want to discuss their pictures of Atlanta. Um, the Twitter, I, I searched politics. You can, um, oh, somebody had a great analogy for what hashtags are this morning. Sorry, I forgot it. But you can, you can actually thread your Twitter conversations around politics and get involved in the conversations that way. Um, those are the kinds of things that I can kind of m manipulate my information intake in a way that conforms to the way that I want it to be. It's about me. And that is really what, what is really powerful about social media. Um, I'll tell you, you know, I, I posted this rail map uh, last week. Um, and you know, the, the blog has some followers and all this kind of stuff. But then, um, and all I did there was I found a map that Citizens for Progressive Transit had, had put up. And I'm like, well, this is interesting and useful to the Atlanta community. So I put it out on our blog. NPR reblogs that to their community. All of those people now see what we are talking about. And then people start spreading it among their circles. And it, it grows and grows and grows. Everybody knows about your, you know, your viral video of the cat playing piano. That's, I mean, that's what this is. It's, I mean, it's not going to get 10 million views, but you know, 200 reactions is a pretty good reaction. Um, so, th and that's kind of what, what this is. I'm, I'm talking among my, my peers um, and, and getting things out there and making it apply directly to a person. Um, and actually, this is the last page. Um, and, so, and so, you know, to kind of wrap it up, um, I, you know, I didn't really want to talk about specific tools necessarily, but kind of how, how we can use these tools to better inform our audience. Because we, we end up, again, talking about tools, and you know, um, a hammer is not a house. We have to kind of think about what is, what is the house that we want to build before we think about the tools that we want to use to build it. And that, that is kind of, I think it's a good way to kind of approach all of this digital storytelling business mm -hmm that can be kind of scary and overwhelming until we kind of think about, I want to convey information to the public that is useful to them and helps them to make decisions about their lives. Okay, how do we do that? And that, that is the question for, that, that I think that we have a unique ability to answer uh, given our, our commitment and our consistency and our credibility. Um, that's all I have to say. If you have any questions, I would love to answer them. Okay, thank you.